I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare. Series 2, Podcast R, Henry IV, Part 1. In Richard II, the first play of Shakespeare's second tetralogy on English history, Henry Bolingbroke deposed the king and himself became King Henry IV. Henry IV, Part 1, the second play in the tetralogy, opens and closes with the king's efforts to secure the stability of England and his hold on the crown. Given Henry's effective practical ability to counteract the depravities of the previous reign, the question of the play becomes what kind of man will inherit from Henry the government of the realm? In inventing three kinds of competitors for that role, Shakespeare reveals the natures of both honor and justice through his extraordinary mastery of the unity and variety that characterize his greatest plays. And he does so in a play that is also dramatically entertaining and, thanks to the invention of the character of Falstaff, contains some of the most hilariously witty comedy ever written. The three characters who are implicitly in competition for the rule of England are Prince Hal, Hotspur, and Falstaff. Hal is the literal heir apparent. The other two, though not literal pretenders to the throne, seek to control England, Hotspur through war and division of the kingdom, and Falstaff through his personal influence upon the prince. Together they represent three distinct principles of government, different kinds of internal government of themselves, and consequently different conceptions of the government of England. Upon the resolution of their competition will depend the justice and integrity of the state. The long tradition coming to Shakespeare from Plato's Republic articulates three parts of man, mind, heart, and body, whose functioning is expressed respectively as thought, emotion, and physical need and desire. Plato imagined these three functions to be governed by three souls, the intelligible, the sensible, and the vegetable. The characteristic virtue called for from the intelligible soul, or mind, is wisdom. The characteristic virtue called for from the sensible soul, or heart, is courage. And the characteristic virtue called for from the vegetable soul, responsible for physical life and growth, as well as from the others, is temperance. Each of these three parts of man can also exhibit the vices opposite to the virtues. Folly opposite to wisdom, cowardice opposite to courage, and self-indulgent sensuality opposite to temperance. But none of these three parts of the human being is autonomous. Following Plato, the tradition recognizes a proper hierarchy among them. As concluded in the Republic, in Greek, the politeia, when the mind trains the heart to help bring the body under its government, that is, when wisdom directs courage in temperance, then order is achieved and justice appears. For this principle, Plato offers the image of a charioteer driving one obedient and one wild horse. This is the source of the four cardinal virtues of Western tradition, wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice, to which Christianity added the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. According to the tradition, in a just man, the mind controls the actions of the body through the well-trained emotions. When either the passions of the heart or the desires of the body rebel against the wisdom of the mind, or when the mind forgoes its function and allows passions or sensual desires to overrule it, internal chaos and consequent injustice inevitably result. Shakespeare's Prince Hal, while he is clearly a dramatization of the historical prince, also represents the well-integrated man whose wisdom of intellect governs his passions and his actions. 
This virtuous man is not what outsiders see at the beginning of the play. For Prince Hal has intentionally misled all of England into believing in the truth of his reputation as a self-indulgent wastrel hanging out in the taverns of the London slums. But the audience knows that the prince has constructed that bad reputation by design. We know it because he tells us in the crucial soliloquy at the end of Act One, Scene Two. Why has the prince chosen to sacrifice his reputation to create this false picture of himself? The answer is that he faces a difficult problem. As the eldest son of Henry IV, he is clearly the rightful heir to the throne. But Henry IV himself, as we know from Richard II, came to the throne by power rather than by right. Despite his having saved England from the self-indulgent and irresponsible King Richard II, Henry's reign has been characterized by self-serving rebellions against him, whose justification is rationalized on grounds of Henry's questionable legitimacy. How can Prince Hal reunite in himself both his father's merit and Richard's right? The merit of his own good character and his right to inherit the throne from his father, such that the unity of England is restored under his rule. Prince Hal's answer is given in the soliloquy at Act 1, Scene 2, lines 195 to 217. I discussed in detail this speech and its structure under Variation in Speech in Session 4 of Chapter 4 in Series 1. Prince Hal will create the illusion that the heir to the throne has a character very like that of Richard II, frightening the nation with the prospect of yet another self-indulgent king. Then, when he actually does inherit, he will reveal himself to be a wise and just ruler. The great surprise and relief of the nation will unify it in loyalty to him. This plan comes to fruition at the end of Henry IV, Part Two. In Henry V, he supplements that success with the plan of unifying the nation through the war to regain England's possessions in France, won by his great-grandfather, Edward III. Hal's plan is so effective that even the king and court, along with some modern critics of the play, are taken in by it. However, interpreters of this play who see it as either a promotion or a critique of Machiavellian cynicism, or as a coming-of-age story of moral transformation in the prince, are misguided by their own modern concerns. As I discussed in Chapter 8 of Series 1, whose interpretation is right? The prince's reputation as self-indulgent wastrel is an illusion, purposely created by the prince. In fact, the play gives us no instance of Prince Hal's behaving in any way but morally and honorably. He never robs except from the thieves in order to return the money. There is no textual authority for picturing him as engaging in compromising relations with prostitutes. Just the opposite. What a pox have I to do with my hostess of the tavern, he says at Act 1, Scene 2, lines 47 to 48. When he drinks with the tapsters, it is to learn their language and win their love, which he does, as we hear in Act 2, Scene 4, lines 4 to 20. Among other things, Prince Hal is a representation of the perfect blending of the humors, harmonized in him to make an exemplary man and king. The audience is never fooled, as the other characters are, into thinking of the prince as being in rebellion with himself, subject to sensualities. All his apparently low-life activities are mere show. The effect of this show is that we find Prince Hal sacrificing the appearance of honor in order to achieve true honor. And in him true honor lies in his fulfillment of his function as heir apparent, to unify England as best he can under a king both honorable and honored. The irony of Henry IV's accusing his son in Act 3, Scene 2, lines 93 to 128, 
of being too much like Richard II is that the prince, with complete self-control and the highest of motives, is outwardly imitating Richard only in order, as he says in Act 1, Scene 2, Line 217, to redeem the time when men think least I will. That time comes at the end of Henry IV, Part Two, the third play of the Tetralogy. As the prince represents the wise man, the prince's foil, Hotspur, also based on a historical personage, represents the passionate man, specifically a choleric man. What? Drunk with choler? says Northumberland, Hotspur's father, at Act 1, Scene 3, Line 129. Hotspur is governed by his desire to achieve glory at all costs, and his method of achieving it is the winning of battles. He is a fighter in every context. His relation with his wife is catfighting. He will cavil on the ninth part of a hair in competing with his fellow conspirators, as he says in Act 3, Scene 1, Line 138. And, of course, he rebels against the king. He would even divide myself and go to buffets with himself when he feels he has erred. Act 2, Scene 3, Line 32. All this life of conflict leads to his actively attempting to divide England itself into three parts drawn on a map in Act 3, Scene 1, and thence into two opposing armies in civil war. These last conflicts put him squarely in the wrong. Shakespeare's two history tetralogies are performed only slightly more than a century since Henry VII unified England after the century of civil wars depicted in them. Even in Shakespeare's time, the threat of rebellions against Queen Elizabeth was never absent. Shakespeare's audience cannot have felt anything but repulsion at the prospect of the civil wars that must result from Hotspur's attempt to split England into three kingdoms. Later, in King Lear, Shakespeare makes similar use of that perennial fear, a fear we may comprehend if we imagine some faction today wishing to cause a coalition of states to secede from the Union that is the United States of America. Hotspur's goal in all his divisions is not destruction, but honor. Yet he cannot find honor in loyalty, or duty, or serving the good of England. His concept of honor is nothing but the personal glory of winning in battle, regardless of whom or why he fights. His only goal is the glory of his reputation, and his only means of achieving that glory is through conflict. Dying, he says in Act 5, Scene 4, Line 78 to 80, I better brook the loss of brittle life than those proud titles thou hast won of me. They wound my thoughts worse than thy sword my flesh. Prince Hal's eulogy at lines 87 to 90 offers a precise assessment of Hotspur's character. Fare thee well, great heart. Ill-weaved ambition, how much art thou shrunk. When that this body did contain a spirit, a kingdom for it was too small a bound. Hotspur's great heart, what Plato called the spirited part of man, lived in rebellion against wisdom of mind, which ought to have governed it. His ambition to remake England in his own image is also the ambition of the heart to govern the head. That ambition of his spirited part repeatedly breaks out against reason, against the king's messenger, the king himself, and even his uncle Worcester in Act 1, Scene 3, against the critic of his plans, himself and his wife in Act 2, Scene 3, against Glendower and nature itself in the desire to turn the course of the Trent River in Act 3, Scene 1, against destiny, with his willful misreading of the failure of allies to show up to the battle in Act 4, Scenes 1 and 3, and against the king again in the final battle in Act 5, Scenes 2 through 4. The prince's other main foil, Falstaff, a character almost entirely of Shakespeare's own invention, 
lives by the principle of indulging his lowest self. In terms of the humors, he is the sanguine type, fat, red-faced, and cheerful. In terms of stock characters, he is the latest and greatest incarnation of the braggart soldier, combined with elements of the vice character from the old morality plays. But Falstaff is much more. He is a realistic, believable, and huge personality. He also is, in his rotundity, an embodiment of the world, and in his actions, an embodiment of worldliness. His superbly witty intellect and his emotions are all in the service of his own sensual pleasures. There is no limit to the joy we take in Falstaff's wit, and the wit practiced upon him thanks to his inventive self-indulgence. I am not only witty in myself, but the cause that wit is in other men, says he in Henry the Fourth, Part Two, at Act One, Scene Two, Lines Nine to Ten. But this supremely entertaining wit is accompanied by utter irresponsibility and immorality. Do not thou, when thou art king, hang a thief, he counsels the prince in Act One, Scene Two, Line Sixty-Two of this play, hoping the prince as king will abolish all gallows, meaning abolish justice in favor of Falstaff's own lower will. I would to God thou and I knew where a commodity of good names were to be bought, lines 82 to 83, bought, not earned. Thieving is my vocation, line 104, as if God, in spite of the Eighth Commandment, would call a man to be a thief. When in Act 3, Scene 3, Prince Hal reports, I am good friends with my father and may do anything, Falstaff replies, Rob me the exchequer, the first thing thou dost. Lines 181 to 184. The use of me in Rob me the exchequer is an ethical dative, not a direct object. It means rob for me. The exchequer is the king's treasury. Finally. To Falstaff, as he says in Act 5, Scene 1, Line 140, honor is a mere scutcheon, and I'll none of it. A scutcheon, short for escutcheon, is the coat of arms hung upon a coffin as a body is carried to burial. In a few moments, I'll return to the scutcheon in specific note 16. All of these highly entertaining attitudes of Falstaff turned to practice prove vicious. Given a leadership role to redeem himself from his thieving, Falstaff instead proves disastrous in that role. He takes money to release from the draft any men fit to be soldiers, and drafts instead slaves as ragged as Lazarus, Act 4, Scene 2, Line 25. In the battle itself, as he says at Act 5, Scene 3, Lines 35 to 37, I have led my ragamuffins where they are peppered. There's not three of my hundred and fifty left alive. Later, in the next play, when Falstaff hears that King Henry the Fourth is dead and Prince Hal is to be crowned, he says, Let us take any man's horses. The laws of England are at my commandment. Henry the Fourth, Part Two, Act Five, Scene Three, Lines 135 to 137. Thus, if Falstaff were ever to have actual influence over the heir apparent, when Hal becomes king, as Falstaff fully expects he will have, that influence would be thoroughly destructive, like that of the parasites that once surrounded Richard II. But Prince Hal is not actually in danger from Falstaff's vanity, though he allows his father and all England to fear that he is. In all the witty exchanges with Falstaff, Prince Hal is constantly jabbing at and criticizing and satirizing Falstaff's corruptions. From Hal's first accusation of Falstaff's being fat-witted with drinking, eating, and wenching, Act 1, Scene 2, Lines 2 to 12, to his eulogy for the supposedly dead Falstaff, Oh, I should have a heavy miss of thee if I were much in love with vanity. Act 5, Scene 4, Lines 105 to 106, we are aware that while it is fun 
and useful for now for the prince to play with Falstaff, and immensely entertaining to us, the prince knows perfectly well that it would be fatal for the governor of England to remain under the influence of Falstaff's vanity. Banish plump Jack, and banish all the world, says Falstaff, in the role of the prince in their hilariously enjoyable tavern drama in Act Two, Scene Four, at lines four seventy nine to four eighty. To this, the prince, in the role of his father, says, "I do," and then, coming out of character and speaking as himself, he adds, "I will." In Part Two. As soon as he is king, Hal does just what here he predicts he will do. He banishes from his presence Falstaff, Falstaff's self-indulgent worldliness, and his own bad reputation. Both Hotspur and Falstaff have false conceptions of honor. For Hotspur, honor lies in self-glorification through winning battles. Act 1, Scene 3, lines 194 to 198 and 201 to 208. For Falstaff, honor is nothing but a word. Act 5, Scene 1, lines 133 to 134. It is in Prince Hal that we find true honor, which lies in the platonic idea of justice. Justice appears in the individual man in whom the wisdom of intellect rules over the passions of the heart and the desires of the body. It appears in the state when the wise man governs it, the army is courageous in obedience to that wisdom, and the workers temperate in service to it. It lies in the Aristotelian fulfillment of one's function. God is not in fact calling Hotspur to be a rebel and to divide England, nor is he calling Falstaff to be a thief. He is calling Prince Hal to serve the good of the whole with all his gifts, including the virtue of wisdom, revealed in the cleverness he inherited from his father, the virtue of courage, as great as Hotspur's and inherited from his grandfather John of Gaunt, as well as from his father, and the virtue of temperance, revealed in his actual behavior and in his ongoing critique of the self-indulgence of Falstaff. In answering that call with virtue, Prince Hal embodies Shakespeare's ideal of good kingship. The tripartite structure of foil characters is joined in this play by an elaborate structure of plot foils founded on the principle that the rebels against the king are like the East Cheap thieves. They prey on the Commonwealth. Act 2, Scene 1, Lines 79 to 82. The higher thieving is represented in Hotspur, the man of courageous heart but no wisdom, and the lower thieving by Falstaff, the man whose only wisdom lies in wit and in the satisfactions of his corpulent body. Prince Hal moves between these two worlds, wittily needling Falstaff for his vices, and at last courageously defeating Hotspur in battle. He is the wise, courageous, and temperate man who will become England's most just king. Now let's look at eight key lines of the play. Key line one. At Act 1, Scene 3, lines 127 to 128, Hotspur says, I will ease my heart, albeit I make a hazard of my head. Albeit means although. As one of my students has pointed out, this is the quintessential Hotspur. The meaning he intends is that he will be satisfied in his emotions, even if it costs him his life, which in the end it does. But we can also hear in it an inversion of the right hierarchy. Hotspur is all about serving the passion of the heart at the cost of being blind to the reason of the head. Key line two. Act two, scene one in this play, like the gardener scene in Richard II, offers a homely foil scene to the main conflicts of the play. The carriers complain that the inn has been ruined since Robin Ostler died, lines 10 to 11. An ostler, from hosteler, 
is the person in a roadside inn that looks after the horses. The disorder of the inn after the death of Robin offers a parallel to the disorder of England after the death of Richard II. Thieves like Gadshill and the Chamberlain, an inside man, and Fleas haunted as Worcester and his faction haunt England. Gadshill's claim that his companions do the profession of thieving some grace, line 71, is a reference to Prince Hal, who is addressed as Your Grace. Key line 3. In Act 2, Scene 4, the trick played on Francis the drawer, a drawer is a waiter or tapster in an inn, may seem somewhat forced and perhaps not very funny to us, but the thematic implication is significant and lies in the prince's description. Francis, though human, son of a woman, line 99, does nothing but carry ale upstairs and downstairs, speaks few words, and uses numbers only for reckoning tavern bills. That is, he is nearly subhuman in having no ambition and no capacity to reason. Offered a thousand pounds, when thou wilt, for a pennyworth of sugar, line 67, Francis can say nothing but anon, meaning just a minute, soon, right away. His opposite, according to the prince, is Hotspur, who kills me some six or seven dozen of Scots at a breakfast, washes his hands, and says to his wife, Fie upon this quiet life, I want, meaning I lack, work. Lines 102 to 105. The me in kills me some Scots is another example of the ethical dative I mentioned earlier. The point is that neither is the prince himself of the mind of Francis, nor I am not yet of Percy's mind, lines 101 to 102. Neither pusillanimous nor foolhardy, neither underambitious nor overambitious. He lives within Aristotle's golden mean, unlike the opposite extremes of Francis and Hotspur. Key line four. The matter of central importance in Act Three, Scene One is the willingness of the factions, under the instruction of the mastermind Worcester, to divide up England. Given the horrors of the Civil Wars of the Roses, Shakespeare's audience would immediately recognize this effort at division to be an evident evil. Ironically, the dividers of England are also divided among themselves, and we are reminded of Falstaff's a plague upon it when thieves cannot be true to one another, Act 2, Scene 2, lines 27 to 28. In this scene, Hotspur and Glendower, each in different ways a man of pride and self-assurance, conflict over the turning of the boundary line formed by the Trent River. Glendower is full of vainglory. I say the earth did shake when I was born, line 20. Hotspur, in the way of bargain, will cavil on the ninth part of a hair, lines 137 to 138. Each wants to be granted honor, but both are determined to act in fundamentally dishonorable ways in order to achieve it. Glendower by bragging, and Hotspur by fighting. To his credit, Hotspur will exhibit bravery in actually fighting in the final battle, from which Glendower will absent himself. In the meantime, Mortimer, who turns out, as the king has called him, to be revolted indeed, having gone over to the side of the rebels and Glendower, is more concerned about the difficulties of communicating with his non-English-speaking Welsh wife than with the stability of England. When the fundamental loyalty to the king is broken, loyalty itself dissolves in self-serving. Key Line 5 In Act 3, Scene 2, Lines 93 to 108, the king makes explicit his concern that the behavior of his son and heir will recreate the disastrous behavior of his predecessor, Richard II. Prince Hal's response moves the king to recognize that his son's character, despite the reputation he has cultivated, is entirely to be trusted. Lines 129 to 159. 
The end of the play will show the prince precisely fulfilling the vow that he makes to his father here. Key line 6 Vernon's glorious description of Prince Hal at Act 4, Scene 1, lines 97 to 110, and his description of Hal's modesty at Act 5, Scene 2, lines 51 to 68, demonstrate that the shining truth of Prince Hal's character, so much misconstrued in his wantonness, line 68, is visible even to his enemies. Vernon's prophecy, Let me tell the world, England did never owe so sweet a hope, Line 65 to 67 will come true. Key Line 7 The villainy of Worcester is confirmed in Act 5, Scene 2, when he withholds from Hotspur the king's offer of peace. Oh no, my nephew must not know, Sir Richard, the liberal and kind offer of the king. Lines 1 to 2 the irony is that Worcester's reason for not accepting the king's offer is that the king will never in future trust Worcester not to be a traitor. In saying so, he reveals that the king would be right not to trust him, for Worcester is here being treacherous not only to the king, but to his own nephew. Key Line 8 At the end of the play, at Act 5, Scene 5, Lines 23-24, to 24, Prince Hal asks the king for permission to dispose of the prisoners. This is a direct contrast with Hotspur's refusal at the beginning of the play to obey the king in the matter of his prisoners. Act 1, Scene 1, lines 92 to 95, and Act 1, Scene 3, line 77. As soon as the king does give Prince Hal permission, the prince demonstrates two forms of magnanimity. To his friends, and to his enemies. He gives his brother Prince John the honorable bounty of freeing the Douglas without ransom, because his valors shown upon our crests today have taught us how to cherish such high deeds even in the bosom of our adversaries. Lines 29 to 31. Prince John then says, I thank your grace for this high courtesy, which I shall give away immediately lines 32 to 33. That is, John will immediately share with the Douglas the courtesy that Prince Hal has shared with John. The spirit of this exchange is precisely the opposite of that shown by Hotspur and Glendower in their argument over boundaries in Act 3, Scene 1, and by all the rebels in their arguments of Act 4, Scene 3. Now, here are 17 specific notes to help you in your reading. Note 1. In Act 1, Scene 1, lines 96 to 97, Westmoreland says, about Hotspur's refusal to send his prisoners to the king, This is his uncle's teaching. This is Worcester, malevolent to you in all aspects. Notice how Shakespeare uses an introductory trochee, bumpa, instead of an I am, ba -bum, to throw extra stress upon the fourth syllable, unk, and then makes the stress fall upon the second this and wuss. This is his uncle's teaching. This is Worcester. So that the heaviest stresses of the line reinforce the sense that Worcester is the evil plotter behind Hotspur's disobedience to the king. In the second of these lines, malevolent to you in all aspects, the word aspects refers to the astrological influence of the planets. Showing one aspect, a planet may have a positive influence, showing another a negative. The planet Worcester, moving around the sun that is King Henry, exerts a negative influence, malevolent, that is, bad-willing, no matter what aspect he turns toward the king. Note 2. In Act 1, Scene 2, Line 46, What a plague have I to do with a buff jerkin? Buff jerkin means the kind of jacket worn by law officers or jailers. Note 3. At Act 1, Scene 2, Line 62 to 68, 
Falstaff and the prince play on four senses of the phrase, hang a thief. A. Line 62. Do not thou, when thou art king, hang a thief. That is, do not enforce the law against theft, for which the punishment is hanging. B. Line 63. No, thou shalt, understood as, thou shalt hang a thief. In other words, you will hang, that is, be hanged, as a thief. C. Lines 64 to 65. Oh, rare, I'll be a brave, meaning a fine or a splendid, judge. In other words, oh, wonderful, as a judge, I will be responsible for applying to thieves the law that says they must be hanged. D. Lines 66 to 68. Thou judgest false already, hinting at the kind of judge Falstaff would be. I mean thou shalt become a rare hangman, that is, become an unusual example of the officer responsible for the physical hanging of thieves. This sense leads to the two senses of obtaining of suits in line 71, being granted a request by the king, and inheriting the clothing of the hanged criminal which was the prerogative of the hangman. Note 4. In Act 1, Scene 2, lines 88 to 89, the prince says, Wisdom cries out in the streets, and no man regards it. The reference is to the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verses 20 to 24. Note 5. To avoid confusion in Act 1, Scene 2, we must know that Gad's Hill is both a hill between London and Canterbury, famous for the highway robberies that occurred there, line 125, and the name of a character, nicknamed for the place, line 129. Note 6. At Act 1, Scene 3, lines 92 and 93, the king uses, and Hotspur echoes, the phrase, revolted Mortimer. Shakespeare, knowingly or not, conflated two historical Mortimer brothers, Roger, the fourth Earl of March, and Sir Edmund. Both were brothers of Hotspur's wife, named Elizabeth, but called Kate in this play. It was Sir Edmund who, fighting for the king against Glendower, was captured and later married Glendower's daughter and joined with Glendower against the king. Note 7. In Act 1, Scene 3, Lines 230 and 233, Hotspur uses the phrases Sword and Buckler Prince of Wales and I would have him poisoned with a pot of ale. Both of these are demeaning images directed at Prince Hal, alluding to his reputation for slumming. The sword and buckler were used by low-class soldiers as opposed to the rapier and dagger of aristocrats. The pot of ale is a drink of the taverns not of the palace. Note 8. At Act 2, Scene 2, Line 4, Falstaff enters shouting, Poins! Poins! And be hanged! Poins! To me, this is one of the funniest lines ever written. As my students know, after it cracks me up, every time, I have often attempted to explain why. The harder I try, the more my students laugh, mostly at me. For what it is worth, I will attempt to explain it one more time. In The Adventure of the Thieves, Poins has taken and hidden Falstaff's horse. Falstaff, having to walk on his own two feet, huffing and puffing, is shouting at Poins to return the horse to him. And be hanged is an automatic colloquialism often repeated by Falstaff. It is the equivalent of, and be damned, or, and to hell with you. As a common colloquialism, it generally follows a verb, as in Falstaff's, tarry at home and be hanged, Act 1, Scene 2, Lines 132 to 133, or the first carriers, come away and be hanged, Act 2, Scene 1, Line 22, or Falstaff's, give me my horse and be hanged, Act 2, Scene 2, Lines 29 to 30. In Measure for Measure, Lucio says, 
Show your sheep-biting face and be hanged an hour. Measure for Measure, Act 5, Scene 1, Lines 354 to 355. In Antony and Cleopatra, Mina says about drums, trumpets, and flutes, Sound and be hanged! Sound out! Antony and Cleopatra, Act 2, Scene 7, Line 133. And in Timon of Athens, Timon, in his misanthropy, says, Speak and be hanged! Act 5, Scene 1, Line 131. Here, the funny part is that Falstaff, in his outburst of frustration, mechanically adds and be hanged, not to a verb, but to the mere name, Poins, as if to his existence itself. Poins! Poins and be hanged! Poins! <laughs> it is funny because it is a mindlessly mechanical, b completely irrational, grammatically and logically, c thematically apt because hanging is the standard punishment for thieves, and Poins has robbed Falstaff of his horse, even as they are all trying to rob the travelers, and D, perfectly expressive of Falstaff's emotion. This is the best I can do to explain why it is funny. That it is funny you must hear for yourself. Note 9. At Act 2, Scene 4, Line 239, Falstaff says, If reasons were as plentiful as blackberries, he is playing on the similar sounds of the words reasons and raisins, which in Shakespeare's time were probably closer in sound, if not exact homonyms, though Shakespeare is not loath to play such verbal games even when the sounds are not so very close. Modern audiences have less tolerance for the stretch than the Elizabethans had. Note 10. At Act 2, Scene 4, lines 391 to 481, it is important to understand that in the little drama performed by the prince and Falstaff, Falstaff begins by playing at being the king, and Prince Hal is playing at being himself. When Falstaff as the king vulgarly calls Hal a naughty varlet, Hal asks, Dost thou speak like a king? and changes places with Falstaff. Then Prince Hal plays his father, and Falstaff plays Prince Hal. Part of the humor lies in the fact that whatever role Falstaff plays, he uses it to justify himself. Falstaff's comical, Depose me, line 435, alludes to Henry IV's fateful deposing of Richard II. Note 11. At Act 2, Scene 4, lines 535 and following, in the list of Falstaff's debts read by Pito, S, period, stands for shillings, D, period, stands for penny, or in the plural, pence, from the Latin denarius, an ancient Roman coin worth ten of the smaller coin called the as or asarius, and derived from the sense containing ten. And O, B, period, stands for half a penny, pronounced hapni, from the Latin obolus, Greek obolos, meaning a nail or a spit of metal, the name of an ancient Greek coin. Note 12. At Act 3, Scene 1, Line 49, when Hotspur says about Glendower, I think there's no man speaks better Welsh, the implication, as a student of mine pointed out, is that Glendower's claims are not but excellent Welsh, that is, that the content of Glendower's speech is negligible. Note 13. In Act 4, Scene 1, Line 122, Hotspur says, Harry to Harry shall hot horse to horse meet and ne'er part till one drop down a course. The alliteration on the five initial H's and the repetitions in the first line express the breathlessness of Hotspur's eagerness to win glory from his rival. Course, C-O-R-S-E, 
is our word corpse, C-O-R-P-S-E. Note 14. The short scene of Act 4, Scene 4, shows us the turning of the tide from the forces of rebellion toward the forces of the king, and also the fear beginning to develop among the rebel faction and within the minds of many of them. It prepares us to find truth in the king's words at the end, Thus ever did rebellion find rebuke. Act 5, Scene 5, Line 1. The external rebuke of defeat in battle is prepared for by the internal dissension and fear that illegitimate rebellion inevitably generates both among and within the rebels. In King Lear and Macbeth, Shakespeare will push to the poetic extreme this correspondence of realms, disorder echoed within the individual mind, in the body politic, and in the whole natural world. Note 15. In Act 5, Scene 1, Lines 101 to 103, the king first seems to agree to venture the life of Prince Hal in single combat with Hotspur, but then changes his mind with, No, good Worcester, no, before he offers the terms for peace. The single combat happens nonetheless in Act 5, Scene 4, within the context of the general battle. Note 16. Falstaff concludes his Catechism of Honor, which articulated his rejection of honor as a value, by calling honor a mere scutcheon. Scutcheon, short for escutcheon, is, as I mentioned, the coat of arms hung upon a coffin as a body is carried to burial. Falstaff means that honor has no substance in itself, but is only an external sign associated with the dead to whom it is useless. Because honor cannot set a broken arm or leg, it has no real significance to him. In this, Falstaff represents the nominalist heresy, according to which abstractions are merely names signifying no reality behind them. Prince Hal embodies the contrary doctrine of idealism, incarnating in his nature and actions the reality of honor. Note 17. At Act 5, Scene 4, Lines 121 to 123, Falstaff, contemplating the corpse of Hotspur, says, Zounds, I am afraid of this gunpowder Percy, though he be dead. How if he should counterfeit too and rise? Falstaff's hilarious idea that Hotspur could, like himself, be so cowardly as to pretend to be dead is absurd in itself and punctuates the difference between the two men's contrary conceptions of themselves, the cowardice of the sensual man versus the bravery of the passionate choleric man. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciated Shakespeare.